Hello and welcome back to Be A Loser. As many of you who follow my channel may know, my wife and I had a baby girl about 18 months ago. We definitely had some things stacked against us when we decided to start our family. We were both in our mid-40s and we were both overweight or obese. Starting a family is one of the biggest and most rewarding decisions a couple can make. And discovering that your efforts have paid off and you've become pregnant can be one of the happiest and scariest days of your life. But once you find yourself in a situation where you feel ready to get pregnant, if things don't go as expected and you have trouble conceiving or complications with the pregnancy, then this can become one of the most stressful and disheartening times of your life. For my wife and me, we were trying for over a year to conceive a child without success. Now, I'll admit that part of me was starting to think that we just missed our window to start a family. But, as it would turn out, all we needed was to make a simple life change and we'd be on the path to having a baby. So, how did that simple change make all the difference? Well, let's take a look at the metabolic process of conceiving a child complications that can occur, factors that can inhibit conception, and of course, steps that can be taken to increase fertility and the ability to carry the child to term. For conception to occur, the female must be producing viable eggs during her monthly cycle, and the male sperm must be strong and healthy in order to fertilize the egg during intercourse. Infertility, which is quite simply the inability to conceive, is becoming more common and this natural and simple journey can be a difficult challenge given all the contributing factors to fertility. So how is fertility regulated in the first place? Well, from the onset of puberty until menopause, a woman's body is designed to have the hormones estrogen and progesterone work together to fuel and regulate her monthly cycle. The bulk of the estrogen is released into a woman's bloodstream during the first half of her monthly cycle. Estrogen works to build the lining of a woman's uterus to prepare it for implantation of a fertilized egg should fertilization occur. The bulk of progesterone is released into a woman's bloodstream during the second half of her monthly cycle. During this time, the progesterone acts to maintain the lining of the uterus that the estrogen helped to build up during the first two weeks of the cycle. If a fertilized egg successfully implants into the uterine wall, meaning the woman becomes pregnant, her body must then continue to produce a large amount of progesterone on a continuing basis to maintain a thick and well vascularized uterine wall throughout the course of the pregnancy. This job of continuous progesterone production is handled quite nicely by a healthy placenta. Now, if there is no implantation, meaning no pregnancy, a woman's body stops producing these large amounts of progesterone, which then results in sloughing off and elimination of the thickened uterine lining, also known as a woman's monthly flow. This cycle repeats itself about once every month until a woman experiences menopause. So estrogen dominating the first half of each cycle and progesterone dominating the second half. Ovulation, implantation, and early fetal development require a careful orchestration of several hormones, including luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and of course estrogen and progesterone. If these hormones are too high or too low at a specific point in a woman's cycle, then conception simply doesn't take place. As many as one in 10 Americans will experience infertility, according to Resolve, a national infertility association. While the causes aren't completely understood, research suggests contributing factors such as diet, exercise, weight, health conditions, stress levels, emotional and mental states, genetics, and a high toxic load in the bloodstream all play major parts in determining one's ability to conceive. Now, I want to focus on one of these factors as it affects many women of reproductive age. 
This is known as PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. For those of you who watch This Is Us, and spoiler warning if you haven't seen any of the third season yet, Kate, played by Chrissy Metz, is diagnosed with PCOS when she and her husband Toby are consulting about IVF, in vitro fertilization. Now this show infuriates me, for many reasons, but for this video it's because the show perpetuates the ignorance about weight gain, weight loss, obesity, and metabolic syndrome diseases that Be A Loser was created to change. I mean, there wouldn't be much drama if you told Kate, and by extension Chrissy Metz, that she just needed to make one simple change to her life, and all her problems related to her weight would go away. But I digress. Polycystic ovary syndrome has only been considered a disease in the last century, but it's actually an ancient disorder. Originally described as a gynecological curiosity, it's evolved into the most common endocrine disorder of young women. Hippocrates, who lived from 460 BC to 377 BC, described women whose menstruation is less than three days or is meager, are robust with a healthy complexion and a masculine appearance, Yet, they are not concerned about bearing children, nor do they become pregnant. Soranus of Ephesus, who lived from approximately 98 AD to 138 AD, observed that the majority of those women not menstruating are rather robust, like mannish and sterile women. The Italian scientist Antonio Vallisneri connected these masculinizing features with the abnormal shape of the ovaries into a single disease. He described several young, married, infertile peasant women whose ovaries were shiny with a white surface and the size of pigeon eggs. In 1921, Achard and Tears described a syndrome whose main features included masculinizing features, acne, balding or receding hairline, and excessive facial hair, along with type 2 diabetes. Further cases in 1928 supported the link between what is now called PCOS and T2D, describing it in the article Diabetes of Bearded Women. Dr. Stein and Leventhal consolidated the symptoms of PCOS in 1935 with their description of seven women with all of the current diagnostic aspects, masculinizing features, hair growth, irregular menstrual cycles and ovulatory cycles, stoutness, meaning obesity, and polycystic ovaries. The breakthrough occurred by making the connection between the lack of menstruation with the presence of enlarged ovaries and merging them into a single syndrome, PCOS. At that time, the detection of enlarged cystic ovaries was difficult, and Stein and Leventhal achieved this either by direct surgical observation, laparotomy, or using a now defunct x-ray technique called pneumorontogenography. The masculine appearance, known as hirsutism, was caused largely by excessive male sex hormones called androgens, of which testosterone is the best known. The biochemical diagnosis of PCOS is problematic because androgen levels are only modestly elevated and unreliable due to their variation throughout the menstrual cycle. However, the effect of excessive androgens is obvious in the masculinizing features of these women. More than 80% of women who have symptoms of hyperandrogenism will eventually be diagnosed with PCOS. Acne is present in an estimated 15-30% to 30 of PCOS patients. However, of women complaining of acne, 40% are eventually diagnosed with PCOS. Studies increasingly linked PCOS with insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. For those who follow my T2D and weight gain series, that word should be familiar. If you break it down into its component parts, it's hyper meaning too much, and emia meaning in the blood. So it basically means too much insulin in the blood. Now that's very, very important, but more on that later. Now PCOS was recognized to represent a spectrum of disease. Not all symptoms may appear in all patients. Thus, only two of the three criteria were needed to classify patients with PCOS. This includes hyperandrogenism, a state of too many androgens, oligoanovulation, meaning few or no ovulatory menstrual cycles, and polycystic ovaries. In 2006, a further refinement to the criteria was made by the Androgen Excess Society who recommended that hyperandrogenism is considered the clinical and biochemical hallmark 
of PCOS. Without evidence of hyperandrogenism, you simply can't diagnose as PCOS. It should be noted here that although obesity, insulin resistance, and T2D are commonly found in association with PCOS, they're not part of the diagnostic criteria. Dr. John Nessler from Virginia Commonwealth University estimates that if a woman has fewer than eight menstrual periods a year on a chronic basis, she probably has a 50 to 80% chance of having polycystic ovary syndrome based on that single observation. Irregular, absent, or rare menstrual cycles are all common symptoms of PCOS. An estimated 85% of women with PCOS suffer menstrual irregularities. The main menstrual problems are anovulation and oligoovulation. During the normal menstrual cycle, the human egg develops from the primordial follicle. It grows during the first half of the menstrual cycle and then is released into the fallopian tubes to be carried to the uterus where it awaits fertilization by the sperm. Ovulation is the release of the egg inside the ovary. Anovulation is the term used for the complete lack of ovulation and oligoovulation refers to a lower than normal rate of ovulation. When normal ovulation doesn't occur, then menstrual cycles may be completely absent, known as amenorrhea, or may last longer than usual, known as oligomenorrhea. Irregular menstrual cycles are caused by the failure of ovulation. The lack of ovulation will result in difficulty conceiving and infertility. PCOS is the most common cause of infertility in industrialized nations and also associated with recurrent miscarriages. However, just having a regular cycle doesn't mean that ovulation has occurred normally especially in women with other evidence of hyperandrogenism. 20 to 50 percent of women with signs of excess testosterone and regular periods still have evidence of anovulation. As we know, during normal menstruation, many follicles begin to develop, with one eventually becoming the human egg that's released into the uterus at the time of ovulation. The other follicles normally shrivel up and are reabsorbed into the body. But when these follicles fail to shrivel up, they become cystic and appear on ultrasound as ovarian cysts. Because 20 to 30 percent of otherwise normal women may have multiple cysts on their ovaries, the mere presence of cysts is not enough to make the diagnosis. There's no correlation between the number of cysts and the severity of PCOS. Remember, PCOS re represents a spectrum of disease. On one end are women with polycystic ovaries, but no other abnormalities. These women often have ultrasounds for other reasons, and the cysts are picked up incidentally. On the other end of the spectrum are women with all of the various manifestations. Weight gain moves women towards the severe end of the spectrum, while weight loss moves women towards the less severe end of the spectrum by improving fertility, ovulatory cycles, and hirsutism. The presence of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome have been frequently noted with PCOS, but they're not part of the formal definition. These factors are found in an estimated 50 to 70 percent of women with PCOS. Now, in addition to the human suffering, the economic burden of PCOS is huge. In the United States, an estimated $4 billion in 2004 was spent on health care related costs. PCOS is one of the leading causes of infertility and in vitro fertilization, a multi-billion dollar industry. This $4 billion bill is three times the total cost of hepatitis C, another significant public health issue. Women with PCOS who do become pregnant are at increased risk of complications such as gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and preeclampsia. PCOS is associated with many diseases that don't form part of the diagnostic criteria. Perhaps the most important is a history of weight gain that often precedes the diagnosis of PCOS. 28.3% of obese women referred to one clinic were diagnosed with PCOS. Now, weight loss has also been proven to reduce testosterone, improve insulin resistance, and decrease hirsutism. PCOS is more common with increasing severity with obesity. It's also recommended to routinely screen for T2D. Measuring fasting glucose alone may miss the diagnosis of up to 80% of pre-diabetic patients and 50% of diabetic patients. 
This misses an opportunity to pick up the disease at an early stage and intervene with lifestyle measures. Current guidelines recommend that women with PCOS should be screened using an oral glucose tolerance test every three to five years. If there are other risk factors, this should be done annually. Patients with PCOS have double the chance of being hospitalized compared to those without the disease. PCOS is associated with obesity, T2D, high blood pressure, and stroke. The increased T2D and metabolic syndrome put women at risk later in life from heart disease, stroke, and cancer. In trying to understand the proper treatment for PCOS, it's necessary to understand the underlying cause of the disease. With its close links to obesity and T2D, PCOS has clearly emerged as a disease of metabolism rather than simply a reproductive disorder. So understanding the link to obesity is the best place to start. In women with PCOS, the risk of T2D and prediabetes increases as body weight increases. There's an obvious connection, but there are three possibilities. PCOS causes obesity, obesity causes PCOS, or both obesity and PCOS are caused by a third factor. So let's first ask, can PCOS cause obesity? Well, hyperandrogenism only affects the distribution of fat, not the increase in overall body fat. High testosterone promotes central or visceral obesity, where the fat is distributed primarily in and around the abdominal organs. As we know from, well, basically all of my videos, this visceral fat is far more dangerous than subcutaneous fat for complications from metabolic syndrome and CVD. An estimated 50 to 60% of women with PCOS have central obesity regardless of their BMI, known as masculinized body fat distribution. This fat distribution is associated with lower conception rates and ovulatory frequency. The heavier a woman gets, the less likely she is to ovulate. So basically the answer here is no. PCOS does not cause obesity. It simply affects the form of that obesity. Okay, so does obesity then cause PCOS? Well, the severity and risk of developing PCOS does increase with obesity, but a direct correlation isn't fully observed. In obesity clinics, a new diagnosis of PCOS was made in 28.3% of cases while there was only a 5.5% prevalence in lean women in the general population. Now, we already know that weight loss improves PCOS, and this was corroborated through studies of bariatric surgery. During bariatric surgery, weight loss was accompanied by decreases in hirsutism, androgen levels, insulin resistance, as well as the restoration of regular menstrual cycles. The diagnosis of PCOS could not be sustained in any of the patients after surgery, showing the potential reversibility of this condition. But obesity is clearly not the sole cause of PCOS. Obesity, but not PCOS, varies widely throughout the world. For example, the prevalence of PCOS is very similar between the United States, Spain, and the United Kingdom, but obesity differs significantly between those countries. Studies show only a very loose correlation between the severity of obesity and the prevalence of PCOS. So no, obesity is clearly related to PCOS, but not the sole cause. And that leaves us with one final question. Are PCOS and obesity caused by some other factor? And we've actually answered that question. Yes. Yes, it is. Hyperinsulinemia. It's well known that PCOS is intimately connected to insulin resistance. Hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance are basically the same disease. High insulin levels will encourage the growth of cells. PCOS is a disease of excessive growth in which insulin as a nutrient sensor is making it worse. In females of reproductive age, the most rapidly growing cells are the ovaries. The hormonal environment is encouraging excessive growth of these cysts in the ovaries. Hyperinsulinemia appears to increase the effect of luteinizing hormone to increase androgen production, testosterone, which produces many of the clinical effects of PCOS. In addition, insulin decreases sex hormone binding globulin, which increases the amount of free testosterone in the blood, which increases the hirsutism seen in PCOS. So it seems obvious that the best approach to decrease PCOS 
and increase fertility is to lose weight, reverse insulin resistance, and lower serum insulin levels. If only there was a simple, natural method for doing just that. Hmm. Sometimes I feel like a broken record, for those of you who know what a record even is. But before we open the curtain and reveal the simple change we can make to do all of that, let's discuss another complication that can arise in many women and cause complications with delivery and carrying to term. I'm talking about uterine fibroids. I actually have pretty intimate knowledge of this as my wife was diagnosed with these fibroids during her pregnancy. They led to a lot of stress for both of us and ultimately to a C-section in order to deliver our daughter. Earlier in the video, we discussed how estrogen and progesterone play a huge role in ovulation and conception. Both these hormones can become unbalanced and this can lead to problems. Many women and even teenage girls in industrialized countries have too much estrogen and or too little progesterone in their systems. So why is this estrogen dominance a problem? Well, estrogen dominance causes a woman's uterine lining to thicken far more than is healthy during her monthly cycle. This repeated excessive thickening can result in localized growths in the muscle and connective tissue that line the uterus. These growths are known as uterine fibroids. So, what causes estrogen dominance? Well, there are three main causes. First is exposure to xenoestrogens. Xenoestrogens are estrogens that are produced outside of the body. Some examples of these are birth control pills, hormone replacement drugs, condom spermicides, conventional personal care products, particularly cosmetics, plastic cookware, growth hormones found in factory farmed animal products, pesticides and herbicides, DDT, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, foaming agents in soaps and detergents. Now, the second cause of estrogen dominance is being overweight or obese. Estrogen is produced in three areas of the body. Obviously, the ovaries, the adrenal glands, and the fat cells. Yep, you heard that right. The more fat cells that a person has, the more estrogen their body produces, thus increasing the likelihood of estrogen dominance. And finally, the third cause of estrogen dominance is chronic stress. We've already seen in a previous video that stress leads to the production of cortisol. Under extreme chronic stress, the body will convert progesterone into cortisol, thus leading to a deficiency of progesterone, creating a hormonal imbalance. This lack of progesterone leads to estrogen dominance. So it becomes apparent when looking at both PCOS and uterine fibroids that what we really need is a method for losing weight as well as reducing stress. And even better would be an intervention that is safe, does all of this naturally, and with little or no side effects. And as it turns out, we do have a method for that. Intermittent fasting. This method, as we've seen, will reverse your diabetes by reversing your insulin resistance. For more on insulin resistance, just check out my video on it. Fasting will force your body to burn fat for fuel, which will help to bring all of your hormones back into balance, insulin, estrogen, and progesterone. And because fasting has benefits to the sympathetic nervous system, it can help to decrease cortisol as well. For more info on cortisol, watch my video on it. Well, and then there are those pesky xenoestrogens. Well, eating a whole clean diet, like, I don't know, a ketogenic or LCHF diet, and avoiding other xenoestrogens from the list, you should be able to dramatically reduce PCOS to increase fertility and reduce fibroids to aid in carrying to term and safer delivery. Now, if you've been insulin resistant for a very long time, then just changing what you eat may not be enough to affect much change. This is where you should add in fasting. So for more information on ketogenic LCHF diets and intermittent fasting, 
check out my series on them. <laughs> the benefits of fasting for fertility are vast. IF allows for all the toxins to be removed from the cells, hormones to be rebalanced, the liver to metabolize any excess hormones floating around the body, such as the xenoestrogens and cortisol. We know that through the processes of autophagy and apoptosis that inflammation is decreased, tissues are regenerated, blood sugars are rebalanced, the immune system is boosted, the nervous system is rested, and the reproductive system balanced to get your body cleansed, healthy, and ready for fertility. Fasting is also fantastic for couples that have undergone IVF, in vitro fertilization, without success or for women who have been on various forms of synthetic contraception because it will remove any excess or synthetic hormones, cleanse the liver, alkalize the bloodstream, and reboot the natural hormonal process of the body. According to Dr. Monica Chala, a reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist at Faki IVF Abu Dhabi, whenever we see a patient struggling to conceive, we assess their calorie intake and analyze their diets with the help of nutritionists. It is common to introduce caloric restrictions with intermittent fasting during the day to help the patient move closer to the ideal body mass index. Not just that, this helps flush out toxins from the body. So it seems pretty clear to me that intermittent fasting is a sound strategy for addressing these fertility issues. But there's one more benefit to IF that I believe was of great importance to my wife and me. Now bear in mind that my wife's pregnancy was considered a geriatric pregnancy because she was over 40. Needless to say, my wife didn't care for that moniker. So why do I mention it? Well, recent studies have indicated that fasting could extend female fertility. In one such study, Jonathan Tilley and his colleagues at Harvard Medical School reduced the calorie intake of adult female mice by 40% and found that significantly fewer of their eggs had abnormal chromosomes once the mice reached the age of 12 months, advanced reproductive years in mouse terms, compared with the mice that were allowed to eat as much as they liked. Such abnormalities in eggs are known to increase the risk of miscarriage and birth defects in older mothers, both mouse and human. Calorie-restricted mice also produced more eggs than normal mice when their ovaries were artificially stimulated and their eggs were more likely to develop into embryos upon fertilization. Our data show that adult onset caloric restriction prevents the age-related decline in oocyte, egg precursor cell, quality and quantity. Tilly and his team also showed that restricting the calorie intake of adult mice extended the mice's reproductive lifespan and increased the chances of their offspring surviving after birth. Now, a second study looked at the effects of controlled starvation, aka fasting, on adult nematode worms. Mark Van Gilst and Gianna Angelo at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle showed that during these periods, the worms' reproductive systems were put on hold, meaning the existing sex cells were destroyed and then regenerated from a new batch of healthy eggs created from remaining stem cells once the nutrients were reintroduced. Van Gils thinks a similar process might exist in humans. This is yet to be tested, however, and the trigger needed to activate such a signaling pathway has not been identified. It might have evolved to help our ancestors preserve fertility during times of famine, he says. One protein that might do the job in humans is called PPAR gamma, which appears to control the rate of ovulation. It's still unclear how much caloric restriction fasting would be needed to turn on such a system in humans. But if the underlying signaling molecules can be identified and ways found to manipulate them, it could help treat a variety of fertility problems and even extend female reproductive lifespan. Says Telfer, fundamentally, if you can understand how eggs initiate into the growth population and you can slow it down, then you would be extending female fertility. And from my experience, fasting does just that. As I said before, my wife and I have been trying to conceive for over a year. Then just two short months after we started intermittent fasting, my wife got pregnant. She carried to within one week of term and gave birth, with some help, to a very healthy baby girl. And just in case you think there's no benefit to the man's fertility in all of this, well, studies have shown that fasting boosts a man's testosterone levels. 
That's right, guys. There's a free, safe way to increase your testosterone levels. No pills required. And the benefit to fertility? Well, increased testosterone levels can increase a man's sperm count. Talk about stacking the deck in your favor. So, you decide for yourself. If you've been trying and failing to get pregnant, if you can't seem to carry a child to term, if you're of advanced age, or looking to try IVF, then perhaps intermittent fasting could be a safe, natural method of increasing your fertility with the positive side effects of losing weight and cleansing your body and mind. Now, I'm not saying it will work for everyone in every situation, but I know it can, and I believe it's worth trying. So, what do you believe? And that's all for now. As always, please subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and share them with friends and family. And of course, keep those comments and questions coming. And consider joining the Be A Loser family of patrons, where you can actively support the fight against ignorance and greed perpetrated on those who are sick. You can choose your level of contribution starting as low as $1 a month. There are tiers to choose from, or you can simply choose your own donation level. Start and stop at any time. As a benefit for patrons, videos will post there first, so you get access a bit quicker. And I've started refilming many of my original videos for consistency with production and editing and to add a bit more polish. But of course, you can always find all the information for free right here on YouTube. You know that I strongly believe that all of this information should be free for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Patreon is just a way to help out if you so choose. There are links in the description, the end of the video, and on the website. As always, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep being a loser.